Prince Charles and the Duchess of Cornwall were last night greeted by the President of Cuba and yet another red carpet roll out for their historic royal visit. The couple arrived at the Palacio de la Revolución, the President's official building, and walked past to Guard of Honor inside the large conservatory-style reception area bedecked with marble floors and foliage. Camilla was wearing an elegant cream and a valentine trouser suit while Charles was in a suit and tie. They were then greeted by Cuba's leader, Miguel Diaz Cano, and his spouse, Lise Cuesta Peraza. The national anthems of both Cuba and the UK were played before the heir to the throne inspected the troops. The two men then sat down for a private bilateral meeting ahead of an official dinner hosted by the president and his spouse. Diaz Cano was handpicked for leadership by the two previous presidents, Fidel and Raul Castro. He became Cuba's leader last year following Raul's retirement. The communist leader visited the prince last November at Clarence House in a meeting which paved the way for this week's groundbreaking royal tour. Charles and Camilla have this week become the first British royals to visit post-revolutionary Cuba. Earlier in the day Charles and Camilla enjoyed a walking tour of the old town amid chaotic scenes, and the refrain of Guantanamo wherever they went. The couple, who have made history by becoming the first British royals to set foot in the communist country, arrived at the Plaza de Armas for an hour and a half long guided tour, helped by guide Eusebio Leo. Wandering around the leafy square, surrounded by picturesque ice cream colored buildings, many dating back to the 16th century, the royal pair looked entranced. The couple, who are being followed by a small British media contingent, were greeted by dozens of jostling Cuban television cameras and photographers taking a keen interest in their historic visit, leading the clearly bemused Charles to comment, they are very energetic, these press people. Old Havana was founded by the Spanish in 1519 in the natural harbor of the Bay of Havana and will celebrate its 500th anniversary later this year. Their first stop was the Palacio de los Capitanes Generales, once the Spanish seat of power, where Camilla, who was carrying a parasol against the 85 feet, looked round in astonishment and mouthed, wonderful. Then it was out onto the narrow streets of the town, large swaths of which have fallen into disrepair much like the rest of Havana, but is now being diligently restored by a large team of craftsmen. Camilla wandered over to a group of American tourists who quizzed her about the Duchess of Sussex's pregnancy. Mimi Ricketts, 50, said, I said are you excited about the new baby about to arrive in your family? And she said yes she was. Mindy Whittle also got the chance to meet royalty and said after her encounter, I love her, Camilla's, dress. We shook hands, do I have to pay extra for that? With their police detail fighting back the crowds, the prince and his wife managed to push their way through to where a colorful group of street musicians were playing, who broke into classic Cuban tune Guantanamera for the first of many times that morning. Charles and Camilla listened, entranced by the smiling energy of the performers, and the prince was seen to throw a few pesos in their hat. Next on their tour was the unveiling of a new statue of William Shakespeare as the latest addition to the area street commemorating notable literary figures. They also stopped off to see a female-run bicycle rental business, Habisai. The couple then went their separate ways, with Charles popping in to see the team of architects that, that are overseeing the restoration of Old Havana, including Ellen Penton, 25 who recently enjoyed a summer school at Charles's Prince's Foundation for the Building Community. It was amazing, I have never experienced anything like it before, she told the clearly touched Prince. As he walked along the beautiful Calle de los Mercaders, a cobbled, car-free street, he reached to shake the hands of dozens of well-wishers. Oh! Oh! shouted one in order to stop Charles in his tracks. I'm so pleased to meet you, he said before peering inside Café Bohemia, in the iconic Plaza Viejas. Inside the Escuela Taller de la Habana, a school teaching young people the skill of restoration through traditional arts, the heir to the throne broke the habit of a lifetime and gave his autograph, on a piece of plaster that will be used on the restored national capital, a local landmark building. I'm so sorry to have interrupted your work, he apologized. Outside he unexpectedly popped into a local barber's, Salon Creo, 
where he sat down in an original 1950s chair. Owner Josephine Nandos desperately tried to get him to let her cut his locks please, just a little bit. She begged, clearly eyeing up the royal baronet. No, no, the prince demurred, adding laughingly, I've just come in here for the air conditioning. He managed a few minutes respite from the heat and the crowds in a small café on Calle Tinente Ray, but then pressed on to meet up again with his wife for a recital at the church and convent of St. Francis of Assisi where they watched a rehearsal by all-female chamber music group, Camerata Romu. He managed a few minutes respite from the heat and the crowds in a small café on Calle Tinente Ray but then pressed on to meet up again with his wife for a recital at the church and convent of St. Francis of Assisi where they watched a rehearsal by all-female chamber music group, Camerata Romu. Camilla carried a parasol to ward off the searing sun but Charles managed to keep cool in the shirt, tie and suit during their walkabout. Meanwhile the Duchess of Cornwall made an impromptu diversion from her official program to listen to a traditional Cuban band during a walkabout in Old Havana. As she made her way from one engagement to another in the historic center of the capital, her attention was caught by the sound of a band playing a bar. She stepped into the bar, where she stood there entranced for five minutes as the band played a couple of traditional numbers, tapping her toes and, possibly, enjoying the fact that the bar was rather cooler than the streets outside. They were brilliant, weren't they? said Duchess. I loved them. The first stop on her solo tour was the Ugar Maternity Hospital, an opportunity for Cuba to show off the health care of which it is so proud. There she met women who are inpatients at the hospital months before their baby is due in cases where doctors believe that the developing fetus needs close monitoring. The Duchess asked one woman when her baby was due, and was told July. I was born in July, the Duchess said. It's a very good month. Another told her she was having twins. I've got twin grandsons, said the Duchess. It is very nice to have twins, they can look after each other. As the Duchess made her way through the crowd, shaking hands with a line of people, she met a living statue, a man standing stock still in a suit painted bronze, who presented her with a rose and kissed her hand. After meeting a group of female entrepreneurs running a bicycle repair business, she was accosted by an Australian tourist. Frank Buckley, 68, who addressed her breezily, good to see you. How are you enjoying it? He said afterwards, she said she had not been here long. She looked to me a little but puffed. But she had no trouble walking up to me and shaking my hand. Her last stop was a children's theater group, La Colmanita, where she was greeted with a lineup of children in bee costumes. One managed to get a kiss off the Duchess who swiftly found herself giving a line of children a kiss. Inside the auditorium of the Teatro de la Orden Tercera, she settled down to watch a girl singing the Beatles Let It Be. Or, possibly, Let It Be, for by the second verse the girl's demure solo had turned into a riotous performance, with little bees dancing energetically on the stage and throughout the auditorium. By the time of their third number, El Cuarto de Tula, a Cuban song made famous by the Buena Vista Social Club, almost the whole of the audience was up and dancing, with just the royal party and a handful of people around them remaining in their seats. Prince Charles and the Duchess of Cornwall were also given a taste of true Cuban culture when they visited a community center in Havana that was originally a water tower. In a feat of architectural engineering to impress a prince, the Moralando Center has become a hub of creativity for Cubans young and old. After being given a tour of the vibrant community center by its director Manuel Diaz Baldrich, the royal couple were treated to a series of performances including a traditional dance by little Cuban girls wearing dresses out of brown paper. It's amazing what you can do with brown paper, joked the prince. They actually look very elegant, he added, to which Camilla added, they were really brilliant. Camilla was then given an impromptu hug by a girl suffering with Down syndrome after children from the special school of Camila Cienfuegos put on their own dance recital. They then met with children learning about filmmaking with the help of Camera Chica, a British council project for audiovisual creation in Cuba. 
then it was the turn of adults to take to the stage with soprano Elizabeth Carmona Mina impressing with an operatic performance and J.M. Clark Perez bringing the house down with the Latin classic Yo Soy El Pundo Cubano. The event ended with the royal couple being given a tour of the inside of the water tank, which had been decorated with artworks by the local community. They then performed the royal ritual of singing the visitor's book. The socio-cultural project Moralando is a local initiative run by a small group of artists and neighborhood residents dating from January 2001. Their main objective was to improve the quality of life of the community, through art. Moralando has free workshops on painting, dance, popular music, percussion, audio-visual and handicrafts aimed at gathering children, youngsters and elderly people. Prince Charles got also spent some time in the ring with young Cuban boxers to find out how the communist island punches well above its weight in the world of boxing. Charles stopped off at Rafael Trejo gym and met youngsters mid-training session. Heavyweight Noel Hernandez said, It was a real honor to meet somebody as famous and important at the Prince of Wales and that he took an interest in our gym. The prince asked the boxers about their diet and training regime. Do you eat salads and protein?" said Charles, who is remarkably fit for a man of his seventy years. I suppose you enjoy beating our British boxers? Charles joked whole feigning raising gloves. As of 1992, there were over 16,000 boxers on the island. Across Cuba today there are 494 boxing coaches and 185 facilities. Of the 99,000 athletes in Cuba currently, 19,000 are boxers, including 81 of Olympic competence, even though only 12 make the Olympic team. Boxing originally arrived in Cuba as a tourist attraction mainly as championship buds between North American boxers during the high tourist season. In 1909 Havana had its first professional fight. In 1910 a Chilean named John Budinich established the first boxing academy in Havana. Two years later government banned boxing due to the violence on the streets between blacks and whites. Boxing matches had to go behind closed doors as it grew popular throughout the island. Despite the banishment of the sport at the time, for the lower classes, boxing constituted a possible ticket out of poverty as well as steady and reliable entertainment. By 1959, Cuba had six professional world champions who were considered to be the founding fathers of boxing as well national heroes of Cuba. These fighters included Gerardo González, Benny Parrott, Elegio Sardinas. In spite of the sport's promise of prosperity, the Cuban boxers who earned a lot of money in the ring almost commonly died impecunious. Some boxers also had ties with the mafia and other sources of corruption. Cuba's boxing reputation also drew foreign boxers as well, such as Jack Johnson, Jack Dempsey, Jess Willard, Joe Lois, Joe Brown, and Sugar Ray Robinson. Although Cuba had traditionally done well in professional boxing, it did not win an Olympic medal in boxing until after 1959 due to considerable resources being devoted to the development of athletes as a result of the Cuban Revolution. Later, Cuba's acclaimed ballet star Carlos Acosta will also welcome the couple to his dance company. The Royals will watch two performances by members of Acosta's group of performers who have won worldwide acclaim since the dance company made its debut in 2016. Acosta is artistic director of Birmingham Royal Ballet, which Charles supports as president, and was principal guest dancer for 17 years with the Royal Ballet. There are no plans for the royal couple to meet Raul Castro, the brother of Cuba's former communist leader Fidel Castro who died in 2016, but the prince and his wife will be guests at a dinner hosted by the country's president Miguel Diaz Canel. Charles met Cuba's president in November last year at his London home, Clarence House, when the foreign leader visited the UK with the delegation of senior ministers. He is a fan of the Beatles and while staying in the St. John's Wood area of London during the trip, visited the famous zebra crossing that features on the group Savvy Road album cover. Cuba is famed for the boxing champions it has produced over the decades and Charles will visit the Rafael Trejo gym and meet fighters sparring in an open-air ring.
Diplomatic sources describe the couple's arrival as a very special moment for the UK and said it came at an important time for our bilateral relationship with Cuba. It will enable us to engage in a way we can develop our political dialogue with the Cubans, government to government, they said. They acknowledged that it came at a tricky time, particularly given President Trump's decision to row back from Barack Obama's tentative rapprochement with Cuba and support of the regime in Venezuela. Trump has described the maligned President Nicolas Maduro as a Cuban puppet. But the source said, we hope this visit will give us a stronger platform to do more in our priority areas of cooperation. We also believe that by engaging in this more energetic way we can develop a better dialogue with Cubans both on agendas of cooperation in terms of projects, commercial opportunities and investment, but also in terms of our political dialogue. The source said the royal visit was being seen as a way for the British government to engage more energetically in Cuba. They said, we see this as a way of entering into dialogue with the government on issues that we agree on but also on issues that we differ. This is particularly important given recent developments in Venezuela. We are also very conscious of the human rights problems in Cuba itself. Referring to a potential clash with U.S. President Donald Trump over the royal visit, the source said, we are very conscious that the UK and EU approach to relations with Cuba are fundamentally different in some ways to the US approach, even through we share a lot of the same values and concerns. But the way the US is driving its policy on Cuba is not about engagement. Our general policy on Cuba is in contrast to, and is going in a different direction from, what the US is trying to do. It's no secret. But, we are confident that we are doing the right thing and are very open about why we are doing it. Our very close relationship with the U.S. enables us to have that dialogue and make clear what we are trying to achieve. Kate Allen, Amnesty International UK's director, said, while Charles and Camilla aren't formal representatives of the government they obviously have influence, and if they can use their visit to Havana as an opportunity to raise human rights issues that would be most welcome. Despite some reforms in recent years, Cuba still locks up dissidents and human rights activists, places draconian restrictions on freedom of speech, and blocks people's access to the Internet. If the opportunity arises, we'd really like to hear Charles and Camilla say something about the need for Cuba to allow its people greater freedom. Yesterday, after being welcomed at the airport, the prince and his wife started their visit by laying a wreath at the memorial for Cuba's national hero, the revolutionary essayist and poet, José Marti. British ambassador to Cuba, Antony Stokes, said, as the British ambassador to Cuba it was an honor to accompany His Royal Highness in laying a wreath at the tomb of José Marti. This historic royal visit is about strengthening our bilateral relationship and looking for opportunities to work together on areas where we see mutual benefit. It also provides a great foundation for broadening dialogue in areas where we agree and also being able to have honest conversations in areas where we disagree.